Frank Abagnale Jr. Uh, so he was great at this, right? He, he could social engineer um, individuals into providing information, giving him tickets, cashing checks for him. I mean, he was very prolific at this for several years before he was caught by the FBI and then on to train them. So, again, any act that convinces someone to do something not in their best interest. Social engineering doesn't, the goal always does not have to be to provide someone's credentials when we talk about cybersecurity or information security. It doesn't always have to be to click on a malicious download. Um, we, we do plenty of engagements where we will call someone up, email them back and forth, ask a question, and the piece of information we're asking for seems like a harmless question. We go to the next person, ask or email about the next piece of information, and by the time we've talked to five people, we have the whole picture of what we need. Why is social engineering so effective? All right, on the left, we see the, tra the traditional, the old-fashioned way how IT systems were built. We have a bunch of computers at an office. They all go through the... Uh, they might talk through the internet. Um, these could be remote computers. If they're at the office, the servers are most likely on-prem back in, back in the day, file servers, databases, etc. cetera. Uh, if we had a remote user, they had a VPN, and they connected into the office. Now, think about the environment now. The edge has moved, as many, uh, many people, many articles discuss the edge moving, and we're using so many tools, Dropbox, Office 365, um, Citrix, uh, SharePoint, Google Drive, so many different platforms that we're using. And at each point, unless you're using single sign-on or a zero trust type setup where we have one point of authentication, what happens when the person is ready to use an application? If you think about it, they log in, right? So people have kind of become conditioned to log into things all the time. It's, we do it all the time. We do it 100 times a day. You log into Office. You log into Dropbox. You log into this application. And it's become second nature to people. Another reason is in, there was some research done by some psychology organizations in 2017. And 70% of workers back then felt they were overworked. Now, how many of you felt like you were overworked in 2020, right? You're working at home. Uh, if you're like me, you're keeping a couple children at home while you're working. And it's been hectic. And employees, users, are trying to rush <coughs> through the tasks that they have to do to get everything done by 5 o'clock so they can go home. So they don't have to work late. Uh, they can make the bosses happy, keep their job, whatever the reason. Everyone's in a rush, rush, rush trying to get tasks done. And... Rush, unfortunately, makes makes it easier for someone like me, a social engineer, um, to social engineer you and get what I want out of you. <clears throat> Another component that adds to this problem is if we humans, we have an innate tendency to trust our friends. We trust the people around us. Um, for the most part, we as humans are not very untrusting pe people. Um, we get to know someone, we trust them. Um, we go to the store, we trust that uh, we're going to pay and get our items. We order something online, we trust that it's going to come in the mail. We trust everyone around us, we trust our families, we trust everyone, and we should trust everyone. But we have to begin reining in our trust. Um, and this makes it, again, easier for social engineers to attack people. Now, in 2019 of June, um, according to Valley Mail, there were 3 billion fake emails being sent a day. So social engineering, phishing, uh, whaling, whatever terminology you use, it's a huge attack vector. And we see that because, according to Know Before, um, according to their research, only 3% of attacks today or malware strictly try to exploit a technical flaw or a technical vulnerability. 97% of, of cyber attacks involve social engineering or attacking a human in some capacity or in some method. I mean, if you think about it, firewalls, security systems have evolved so much over the last 20 years. 
let alone just the last 20 years, let alone before that, it's trying to attack a firewall, trying to attack a solution is going to be so much harder than just trying to attack a human. And social engineering, so I want to look at a few, just a few examples of huge data breaches that you probably know about um, that were caused by social engineering. Um, you guys remember the 2016 election, um, the DNC hack. I'm not not to get political, but this was a great example of social engineering. Um, this fake email came in, and you can see it was from accounts.google email. Um, it looks semi-legitimate because it's got Google in the um, domain. And we do this a lot with social engineering engagements that we run, um, or if it's part of a pen test or red team engagement. We'll, we'll buy a domain, something like this, that looks semi-legitimate. And it said someone has your password. It told them to log in, reset it, and we, know, we all know the story. Of course, there should have been some dead giveaways in this. Um, a bit.ly address. Google's not going to send a bit.ly address. Um, the format in this looks off. Um, of course, this came later. This wasn't obvious back then, but it came from Ukraine, an IP address. But there were some telltale signs here um, that the user should have realized. Uh, you, you guys remember the Sony hack um, back in was it 2012, 2013? Um, the North Koreans upset about a film being made. Social engineers and employees at Sony, and they use those credentials to get in, um, destroy data, wipe hard drives, etc. Not far from where I live, Greenville, South Carolina, um, it, there was a cyber attack um, at the water company. And it was all started by an employee clicking a phishing email. Ransomware that hit the U.S. gas pipeline. And the last this last example in this one, we see this is coming close to critical infrastructure. This is a huge problem. Operations were halted for two days at a natural gas compression facility um, because of ransomware that started with um, an employee phishing. <laughs> so... Now let's get to the hands-on part of how we carry out social engineering engagements um, and give you some tips if you are conducting social engineering engagements, fishing exercises, if this is part of penetration testing. Um, again, a disclaimer, don't try this on anyone unless you're authorized. Hopefully everyone does that with anything you do with security <clears throat> or if there's a bug disclosure program. So, of course, we always start with relation information gathering. Um, we'll get into some of the ways that we typically carry out OSINT or open source intelligence. I'm gathering information, mostly to gather information. We we like to build a relationship and rapport with an individual or a group of individuals before we attack. We never um, now for. Back up for social engagements. Yes, most of the times we have a methodology where we will um, work simple fishes and get more complicated as the engagement goes on. Um, and this is to for reporting to show them what level each of the people in scope for the attack are. But if this is part of a penetration test or a red team engagement um, and we want to accomplish a goal, I'm never my first email typically is never going to be the ask. I'm never going to ask for someone to click a link. I'm never going to ask for someone to log in. I'm never going to ask for someone to download an application in my first email. I'm going to build into that in a way that seems legitimate. I build a relationship with these people. All right, so I might call them up. We are X company. It's the end of the year. We're trying to get rid of some cash for tax reasons before the end of the year. I've got $500,000 to spend. I'm looking to buy X, Y, and Z. Can you help me? We're going to start a real conversation. Of course, I'm going to have to do my homework and learn this industry and what kind of things I might be talking about. So I look like a fool in the middle of it. And I'm going to build this conversation up to the point where there's a need to send a PDF or to send a link or something. Um, and I pick my um, scenarios accordingly so that I have that opportunity. But I never start with that in the first email. Um, and that gives us a much higher success rate. And after we build a relationship, what we just talked about, we move to exploitation. 
and then we execute on what we have gained, the knowledge we've gained, the credentials we've gained, um, the foothold we've gained through malware, C2 framework, or something of that nature. All right, so how do you accomplish social engineering? Something to think about if you are crafting a social engineering attack is people respond based on logic or emotion. Um, Logan, I'm sorry, I have 30 minutes. Yes, sir. Up to uh, four, five thirty. It's okay if you uh, run over a little bit, and then uh, we'll let you do questions. So, all right. All right. So, for the most part, people respond based on logic or emotion. If someone responds logically, they're going to stop and think about it. If they respond out of emotion, they're not going to think about it. And that's my goal in social engineering is to get someone to respond out of an emotion. And as such as possible, I don't want to totally obvious uh, email hackers have stolen $1.5 million out of your bank account. Sure, that could cause a lot of emotion, but that's totally not legit sounding. I want to add emotion in a subtle, legitimate sounding way. And there's a few emotions that work well with social engineering. First of all, fear. Fear of something happening. Excitement. Um, one social engineering engagement we've done, one social engineering scenario rather, um, that we've done successfully at multiple companies is if they have a dev team or another team, we'll, we'll say at the end of the year, um, you guys have done a great job this year. You've helped our company grow. We want to ask you a few questions, how we can improve your department, fill out this questionnaire, and we're going to be giving away iPhones or tablets to employees who fill it out. It causes excitement. People want to fill it out. Um, they go to this fake form, and they log in. Authority. Um, we all know that people respond to authority. And we've been trained not to question authority. Um, other cultures, this may not work. Um, for an example, the Israeli culture um, is very much that you don't take authority at uh, for what they say. You challenge, you ask questions. I mean, the Israeli military... Uh, they are trained to question authority. So the scenario might not work in every culture. Um, we just finished an uh, engagement for a company in the Middle East. We had to pull um, different emotions than we would do on a company here in the U.S. Sympathy. Um, if I'm doing reconnaissance on targets and I find that someone um, donates to a certain charity or they support a certain charity or effort or something of that nature, and they are very sympathetic to, that might be a good scenario for me. Ego stroking. <clears throat> Most everyone at a job feels like they are not recognized for the work they do. Um, and if I can create a social engineering scenario that is going to stroke their ego, make them feel good about themselves, feel good about the work they've accomplished, that can be an effective approach. It doesn't work on everyone, um, but you can kind of figure out from their social media um, what they post, if this might work. Um, so back to what I was saying. We want to build rapport with the people. Um, I try to always have a conversation, a work up to my ask. Uh, I, again, I never try to ask right up in the first email because that's always suspicious. Hey, go to this link, um, log in this portal, unless it's something that seems completely legitimate. Like someone shared a SharePoint file with you and there's a link to log in. There are cases where it does work. Um, but overall, we have found building into the ask um, to be very effective. And back on that topic, before I go on, another thing that we always try to do is we always try to use scenarios that we can close the loop on. I don't ever want to leave someone hanging. So back to my example, if we're in the middle of a sales, um, the sales call that I mentioned, we've got $400,000 to spend. We have a whole conversation. I'm not going to, once they log in, cut them off, leave them hanging. I will come back and say, uh, we found X vendor. Um, they're going to give us a better price. Um, I'm sorry to do this to you, but my boss has told me to go with them. So, sorry. Thanks for all your help. I always come back and close the loop so that to not arise, arouse suspicions. Another thing very effective when it comes to social engineering is the principle of reciprocation. Um, 
people, even if they don't think about it subconsciously, if something does, someone does something for you, you want to thank them. So when you're walking into a building, someone holds the door for you. What have we all, what have we all been taught to do since we were two? You say thank you. And this principle can be very, very effective when it comes to social engineering. Um, if I do something for you, I help you out, you want to help me out. If that can be incorporated into a social engineering scenario, it can be a very effective, effective way, especially if um, it's physical social engineering, um, on-site testing, getting into facilities or something. Um, it, that can be very useful. All right, so some tips for actually conducting the social engineering attack. First of all, when it comes to the interaction with the individual, always have no more than one or two either pieces of information you want to gather or one action that you want the individual to take. Um, don't try to cram too much in. If this is a big organization, I, and I need to know what operating system they're using, um, what antivirus they're using, um, are they using... Office 365, I have three questions. I'm not going to try to get all of that information out of one person because they're going to get suspicious. Why is this person asking me all of this? I'm going to split this between three people and make it as casual of a conversation or an ask as possible. Um, so for an example, we had an engagement last year. Um, pretty big facility. Um, we wanted to know um, what antivirus they were. So I call up an individual, claim to spoof my number, of course, claim to be from IT, saying that we were having some uh, suspicious, interesting alerts um, being sent from the antivirus on their protection on their computer. Uh, we want to make sure that their protection was right. And so I asked them, uh, go to your toolbar, tell me what color your icon is. So we're trying to make sure you're on the right version because something is looking funny about this. Um, they went down, they hovered it, told me the color it was. Um, asked him to right click, give me the number off of it to help us figure this out because it was seeming really odd. Uh, the person did not want to. They thought it was suspicious. I told them I totally understood um, that that was good for them not to want to give that information out of the phone. I'd send someone down to their desk to talk to them. And that put them at ease, and they gave me the inf information that I wanted. I couldn't have actually sent someone there because I wasn't on site. But keep that minimum. Keep that how much you want out off of someone to a minimum and try to think ahead of what their questions might be, what their objections might be. W run through a few conversations, scenarios in your head, especially if this is going to be over the phone um, and you're going to have to do this off the cuff. Um, get your scenario down. Just think about it a little bit so that you're ready. Um, so for example, we had a, another social engineering engagement. This is actually the same company. Um, and there was a vice president um, we had fished him, got his credentials, and we were trying to get around his two-factor authentication. Um, so I called him up, told him they were using Office 365, told him that we were doing some updates on the, I threw in some jargon so that he would not likely understand. Uh, we were working on so, so some updates on the single sign-on server. Our updates were, had crashed the server. Uh, we were trying, to, in the process of trying to... Um, revert those updates um, and people were getting locked out of their accounts because this was single sign-on. I wanted to not let him get locked out. I just need to send him a code and he could read it to me and I could put it in the system. Um, so of course he was a little wary at first. He wanted to know why my number looked a little funny on his phone. I was spoofing my number. Um, of course I already thought about this, told him I was on vacation, but because of how bad this was, I was having to work remotely to help them. Um, now he felt bad for me. He felt bad that I'm on vacation having to work on this, so he wants to help me. Um, so he read, read me the code, and what I had actually done is I logged into his account, and it sent him the code that he just read me. So when you're looking for gathering information, search engines is the place to start. Google. You can find so much information using Google. Um, if you're familiar with Google Dorks, um, if not, go Google it. Google it. 
uh, look up Google Dorks, D-O-R-K-S. There's a complete database of them. Um, they give you all kinds of things you can look up. For example, if I'm looking for email addresses, I'll put in quotes. If I'm looking for at whitehouse.gov, and it'll search for it. If I'm looking for in, in the text of a page, use the in text colon. If I want to only look at a on a certain site, you use site colon whitehouse.gov, then I want to look in the text on that site. And this can get very, very complicated. There's all kinds of queries you can do with this. Um, all right, so the top one here, this is a common way that we'll look for subdomains. I'm looking for site cisco.com, but not www, so not the main domain. So that's going to give me a list of every subdomain owned by them. Um, another way I would look for subdomains is crt.sh. Um, it's a certificate uh, querying site, and it basically queries uh, internet search, so it keeps the database of them. So I'll put in a domain, and it'll give me all the subdomains that have certificates created for them. Um, another way, again, on site cisco.com, I can look for PDFs that have confidential in the title or password. Um, you can look for Google uh, documents, um, Cell files, on and on and on. So look up Google Docs are very, very useful for your open source intelligence. Uh, the kinds of things I'm looking for when I do an OSINT, email addresses, of course, sensitive confidential files, any presentation files. If people from that company have given talks and their slides are up, uh, there might be information I can glean, software they're using, events they've been to in the past or are going to. Um, those are great ways for social engineering. Hey, I met you at X event. I want to follow up with you about X or Y or whatever. Any recognitions or awards that have been given? Uh, we had a company that we were able to fish a couple years ago. They had been recognized by a pretty well-known banking association. So we were able to fish them, act like we were a very well-known newspaper. We wanted to do an interview about it. We sent them an NDA, quote unquote, meaning there was a login. Um, had a fake login. We got the credentials of the users, and we were able to work that scenario. Their children's names. People, a lot of people use their children's names and their passwords. Pets' names. Um, anything about their background, their birthplace, high school, engagement photos, their maiden name, all of that can be useful or not. I typically, uh, create a spreadsheet for each user, um, start filling in information about. Another place to go look, look is the Wayback Machine. You can look at a website, look at people who have worked at a company in the past, if they've made announcements they've had in the past that are no longer there. Google News, um, if, I want, if I'm looking for a specific company, I'll look for information about them in the news, um, and that can be used against them. Email addresses. Of course, I showed you how to just use Google to find email addresses. Another good tool for is the Harvester. Um, it comes with Kali by default. Um, you can find email addresses. LinkedIn um, depends on their privacy settings, but if you use this um, um, this URL right here um, is a way to verify if you think an email is legitimate. And again, this works if they've used their company email to sign up for LinkedIn. The MX Toolbox. Um, there's several services like this, but we, I always try to figure out, okay, what mail provider are they using or what security filter system are they using that helps me gauge um, how difficult this is going to be. Um, a lot of, there's several methods for sending Phishing emails, a lot of times we will actually buy a legitimate domain. We'll buy a legitimate Office 365 account um, from one of many vendors, and we'll use that to send email. If the people are using Office 365, my emails, unless I do something super spammy, are pretty much guaranteed to get into their inbox past spam filters. Um, of course, I'm not, I don't add attachments with malware in those. I always link out to those. Um, <laughs> I always like to figure out um, what email filter they're using, um, SPF, how it's set up, et cetera. Social media. Everyone, many people post their lives on social media. That's always a great place to go to recon 
looking for things like this. All right, so this post person was excited about their new job, posted this on Instagram. What can I get out of this? I know they're using Mac OS. Um, I, I'm going to try to zoom in, see if I see passwords, what's written on those stickies. Um, I'm looking at the people in the background. What kind of computers are they using? Can I see faces? Are these people connected? Do I know who works with who? Um, any of that kind of information. Or this one. Um, we know these people like the San Francisco 49ers. I can look at their computer now. I know what operating system they're using or back at this point. I know they like donuts. I know some of the applications they're using, Word, PowerPoint, um, and whatever else I can figure out. I'm going to go look at the shortcuts on the desktop. What are they using? What do they say? And this is all information that I put into my file or my dossier on the individuals at the company. All right, look at this one, this Instagram photo. Seems harmless, but I can gain a lot of information about this. I know what operating system they're using. I see there's no printer on the desk, so they're likely using a central printer. So I could come up with this scenario of a scanner at a central printer, and it has sent you a file. Um, I see they're using a VoIP phone. Maybe I can email them a quote-unquote um, voicemail message. There's lots of information that can be gleaned out of seemingly innocent pictures. Again, this is obvious. If the physical penetration is in scope, or I'm trying to social engineer my way into a building, um, looking at what kind of tags, are, uh, name tags they're using, what they look like, if I want to create a fake one, then I can come up with a way if, if the RFID or something, use a backpack cloner, uh, get near someone, clone it, and then have a legitimate looking badge. Again, people posting their badges. Um, IGstory.com is a great way to find information about people. Search my bio. Um, there's a book I'm going to send you a pic show you a picture of at the end. They have a ton of tools, solutions you can use for doing open source intelligence. Of course, Twitter. I always look at the company's Twitter. I look at who the company's followers are. Are the any of the followers the employees? I figure, and then I can figure out the employees. Twitter handles, what kind of things they're into, what they're following, what are their interests, what are they talking about. The company I'm looking for recent events that they might have hosted onto um, anything of that nature. Upcoming events. Um, this is a great engage, uh, scenario to throw in something like, hey, we forgot to have you sign this one document. Can you sign this document for us? And I can either payload that document or have them log in, get their credentials. Um, here's a quick search. If people at that location are geotagging their images, uh, this is not as common as it used to be. A lot of people are turning this off. Uh, you have to go turn it on in Twitter now. But if images are geotagged, you can go to Google Earth, get the coordinates of a specific building, and Drop those coordinates into this query here at a distance you want to look away from that building. And now you'll have all of the images, tweets, etc. from that location. That can be very useful for finding employees at a company. Um, of course, go to the slash media of a Twitter handle. Look at all their pictures. Um, tweet Beaver. You can get the friends, followers, and conversations for certain people. LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a gold mine for social engineering. I can find employees' names. I now know what department they're in. I know who their bosses are. I know what their responsibilities are. I know what kind of software they, they use because a lot of people put in their LinkedIn bios at X company. I handle X, Y, and Z software like this person who handles threats and vulnerabilities at Salesforce. Um, he's from, used to work at Microsoft Cisco. Um, plenty of information to be gleaned from people's LinkedIn files. Communities and forms. Um, Stack Overflow. A lot of times people will people come here to post questions and a lot of these questions are very technical. Um, as you can see, this is a very technical question about 
ESXi 6.5 Citrix PF Sense 2.4.4 VLAN setup. If this is the company that I'm targeting and I'm able to see that user handle because they've used the same handle here that they use on Twitter that they use everywhere else, I know exactly the version of the firewall they're using now. Uh, we've done this before, we found code bases on GitHub, um, found very specific info about software, servers, etc. But one thing I want to point out, as you can see here, they're talking about QNAP, a Dell 710, um, Sophos, uh, things that they've tried. So this, I know some of the software they're using. I know specifically what brand servers are using. There's a lot of scenarios I can come up with off of this information. Um, if this company doesn't dev work, I always check out GitHub because, as you can see, these people have a hard-coded password. Um, and that can be very useful. Repositories that should be private, made public, those are all things I'm looking for. Um, of course, I'm looking for documents. Uh, we talked about this a little bit with Google Dorks, but okay, so file type colon, if you put this in Google, you can look for PPT, PowerPoints, PDFs, documents, text, you can look for Excel spreadsheets. Uh, and as you can see, this was a company that was in scope for um, targeting, um, and this was a clearly confidential document that someone had left on a site somewhere that was accessible and they did not realize it. Um, I always look at videos. I go to the company's YouTube channel oops, and I'm looking for the way that people talk. If I'm going to be targeting someone who's in scope, I want to know the kinds of words they use, um, what their general vibe is, what their personality is, so that I can match them and come up with something that they like, something that appeals to them. Um, the kinds of words they use. IP addresses. Um, you can use Shodan. Um, you can use DNS lookups, Leaf DNS. Um, there's all kinds of ways to find IP addresses. So, one of, a common way that we get credentials will set up fake portals. So this is a fake email about a 401k. If it's year end, we'll come up with something like this. Um, we were given a bonus, profit share. Uh, this works good at the end of the year. Uh, so this is the real 401k site. Um, this is our fake site that we created. And they log in, we get the credentials. Uh, there's many, many ways to go about how you handle this, how you set this up. Um, over last year, we tried uh, one method that was worked well for us. Spin up a VPS, virtual private server, put a bunch of WordPress sites on it, and it's pretty easy just to set up a one page. Um, we'll use a contact form with a password field to grab credentials and send it to us when they're captured. Um, there's different ways to do it. You can set these up on Azure, use an Azure fronting. Um, you can set these up with HTTP proxies um, to help get around multi-factor authentication. Um, so that when the person logs in, it recycles the um, session cookies or keys. Uh, there's many different ways to go about it. A fake Office 365 portal that we've set up, a fake LinkedIn portal that we've set up, a fake OWA portal we've set up. Um, and these are just a few of the types of fake portals that we have used. It all depends on this company, what they're using, and how we can be as close to I want my social engineering scenario to be like everyday life to these people. I'm asking you to do something you do 100 times a day. It doesn't seem out of the ordinary to you. Um, I might ask them to install software or an app. Uh, that gets a little more difficult to do. I'm going to have to do a lot of recon, figuring out what antivirus they're using, what applications they have installed. If I can call someone up, have a few conversations, figuring that out so that I have them install a new piece of software. Maybe it's as simple as having them install team viewer quick support to give me a remote session onto their computer um, or actually install some malicious payload that I've sent. Um, quick story about one of these types of attacks. We actually got a security engineer at a company to install malware for us. Uh, we sent him a payload at PDF. He downloaded it, ran the script in it. Um, shortly thereafter, he figured out what he had done, but he had 
tweeted out he had failed a cybersecurity certification um, the week before our engagement. So that was perfect for me. I bought a domain very similar to where he had um, taken the test, sent him an email. Um, we were very, very sorry. We realized that between X date and Y date, everyone who took the test were given the wrong questions. We're going to give you a free retake. We're very, very sorry for the inconvenience this has caused. Um, we just need you to fill out a few questions so we can get this rolling for you. And that was a payload of PDF that gave us a backdoor to his computer. Um, he downloaded a random script. We got a backdoor until I guess someone else was secure. What happened? Um, and it was cut off. Malicious documents. Like I just talked about that too. Um, all right, so I got ahead of myself. So this was the email we sent to that individual about the OSCP they had taken. Um, we downloaded that malicious form, and that attack was successful. So we have social engineering is an effective way. Um, when we run all of our engagements, we run over the past few years. Our average click rate is forty to fifty percent. Pretty much, we get 40 to 50 percent of the people we test to actually click, and typically between 15 and 25 percent actually provide us credentials. Um, over 2020, that has gone up quite a bit. People working at home, busy, not paying attention. This is a big problem. How do we change it? I like to, of course, security awareness training is key. We have to train our employees. And we have to keep it in front of them. Something that's out of sight, it's out of mind. We've all heard the expression. Once a year, our annual security awareness training doesn't work. Um, it needs to be all the time, at least once a month. We need to make the training short. We don't want to bore them. We need to make it applicable. Uh, something that actually helps them, that they can understand, not with a bunch of jargon. Um, all right, does Joe Blow in accounting need to know what billing is? No. He just needs to know that someone is trying to get his credentials. They're trying to get him to download something. They don't need to know all the technical jargon. Let's make it as easy to understand, as applicable as possible. And then I recommend that people take a sort of a step back and do what I call an OSINT self-assessment. So go look at your social media accounts. Go look at your YouTube channel, um, if you have one. Look at any your online presence, take a step back and look at this and see, okay, what is posted about me? What is known about me? Um, so like that scenario I just talked about, it was known that he had failed a test. This should have been part of his self-assessment. This is posted about me. This can be used against me now. Um, an attacker could potentially try to target me with this information because it's public. So make go through all your social media accounts Train your, the employees to do this and assess what is publicly known about them and expect an attacker to you try to use that information against you. Finally, always verify. Never trust, always verify. Um, if you train employees to verify, um, don't punish them if this takes longer. Use an out of band verification. If the request came in form of an email, call up the individual. Don't go use the phone number in the um, signature, of course. Go to their website, look up the number, go to your directory, look up the number you know that this person works at, dial their extension, and verify it. If they're on the phone with you, send them an email. Hey, that's the worst thing I can hear. If I'm on the phone with someone and they tell me, all right, I want to be sure this is legit, I'm just going to send you an email to your company email address. And then once you tell me what that email says, what can go on? That's the last thing I want to hear because I'm not going to get that email. Never trust, always verify. Another big key, in my opinion, is if it causes any kind of emotion, period, any emotion, that is fear, excitement, anxiety, pressure, as in from authority, compassion, it pulls on your compassion strings, pride, ego stroking, any kind of emotion, period, stop. Do something else for five minutes and come back and read that again. When that emotion is worn off, you're clear-headed, you're thinking logically, your employees are going to be much less likely to fall for social engineering because it's most likely not real if it causes any kind of emotion. There are a few cases where it's legit. Um, if you're looking for tips for open source intelligence, this is a great book. Um, I recommend you buy it. If 
this is your thing or something you're planning to do. Open Source Intelligence Techniques by uh, Michael Bazell. It's a great book, tons and tons of valuable information. And if you trust me, that is the QR code you can use to get the slides. If you don't trust me, go to browserling.com, B-R-W-S-E-R-L-I-N-G. Um, put in the, the link, it's gonna take you to, and you can verify it that way on uh, someone else's remote computer. That was a great ending. I have to say, wow, <laughs> I hope that's not malware. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to say, after uh, hearing all of that, I, I, will, I first want to thank you, but second of all, I think I think we should all reflect on and review our social media to see what can be, you know, weaponized against us. And the the one example was Stack Overflow that impressed me. So thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Oh, absolutely, my pleasure. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, I think we, yeah, please drop your questions in the Q and A or Tech Talk chat, uh, and I will also pull up the flag. So uh, I'll take care of that. Feel free, and I will read them off. Share your screen. Okay. All right. So the flag is up. Um. Okay. George asked. Flag. Uh, huh? um, what do you do if and when you get caught? Uh, George, can you elaborate, like, what, which role, who are you talking about, particularly? There's a link to those slides, I just put them in the chat if anyone's interested. Got it. Alright, I'll pin that, thank you for that. Okay, so George is basically asking, uh, when someone asks to verify your email over the phone, uh, what do you do if you get caught, basically? He, he, uh, he used your nightmare scenario as an example. I'm not sure if you can answer that. If I can backpedal, uh, sure. try to come up with a story off the fly, I'm going to, if I, if it's not going to arouse suspicion, I'm going to try it. If it does arouse suspicion, well, okay. Um, it depends on the scenario. Um, if this is a physical engagement, I'm caught. I'm going to try to get out of it. Now, however, I have been on physical engagements and I was caught and the police were on the way, so I have to confess up. Um, it, it really depends on what's happening. But I always typically try to think ahead and come up with some scenario in case they do want something like that that I can throw in legitimately. Great. Uh, I actually have a question. What's sure. your favorite, um, in the past, from experience, what, what has been your favorite... I guess social engineering hack to that you've maybe performed throughout your work. If if you can share that, I'm not sure if you can. Favorite or most successful? Uh, both. Well, let's hear both. Um, my favorite is always bypassing MFA. That's just fun. Um, so we had an engagement in November, and this is probably one of my favorite. So the engagement was actually over the Thanksgiving holiday, which was perfect for me. <clears throat> so. Um, the way I led into the scenario was I bought a domain very, very similar to the company's domain, and we began sending out emails a week before Thanksgiving. On Thanksgiving Day, we're going to be doing some maintenance on the servers. Um, this shouldn't affect you. It is our authentication server, so if you do get locked out, that's what's happening. We're going to be adding multi-factor authentication for users who don't have it in place. A lot, a lot, a lot. Of. And I reminded them the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, don't forget, we're going to be doing maintenance tomorrow if you get locked out. If you try to work over the holiday, that's why. On Thanksgiving Day, all of the employees that we had fished and got credentials for up until then, we started calling them up. Hey, we're having problems with our server maintenance. Um, I'm trying to keep you from getting your account locked up. Um, send me this. I'm going to send you an authentication code to re-authenticate you. Um, I'm really sorry for ruining your holiday. Out of the five people that we tried, we got four people's 2FA codes. Um, so that was pretty fun. Sounds great. Um, uh, most successful, so I'd probably say, is the iPhone giveaway for dev teams that we've done. Uh, by far, that's been one of our most successful. 
people love the like the reward of an iPhone, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, our uh, eboard member from ACM, uh, Sreya, she asked, "Why were the police on the way uh, when you mentioned them?" Um, that was at a pretty large financial facility bank. Um, and that was their standard practice. If they found someone in the building, they called the police. They had not, of course, been informed a pin test was happening. Um, they quickly reversed action once they had figured it out. Um, I think I recall correctly on that engagement, security knew we were there for safety reasons. Um, so they had kind of delayed, delayed it a little bit. And they were able to help us out so it didn't get too ugly. But it was their standard practice, and that's what they are following. I see. And then uh, Sreya also post a, uh, or posed a um, legality question with, uh, could using OSINT be illegal if everything is available publicly, technically? I am, not a, I am not an attorney. <laughs> but my personal opinion is, if it's public, what's the problem? I see. That's a great disclaimer, by the way. <laughs> Um, and then Andres asked, um, what is the most trouble that you've gotten into? I, I know you uh, would probably get out of it, but maybe initial trouble before everything was sorted out? Um, I think the most trouble I've gotten to was actually not with social engineering. It was with a pen test. Um, I was doing some, well, social engineering. I, I was in, this was an internal pen test. The, the scenario was I was looking like an employee working at a desk. Um, and I was actually hacking them and I was using, uh, Ettercap to do some DNS poisoning, um, to send people to my fake login. I was only trying to target a certain department who used a certain portal subdomain of the company to do all their work. And I accidentally put asterisk.domain.com. So everyone in the company was getting, um, DNS poisoned by me. Um, so they had to blow my cover, explain to the entire IT team who I was and what I was doing. Uh, we had a pretty heated meeting in the conference department room, and I had to explain my attack. There's quite a few unhappy network engineers who so had to go uh, do map table things. Great. Uh, um, well, I'm glad it got sorted out. I hope. Um, Cody asked, uh, how can you break into the field, I guess, of social engineering and OSINT? Um, practice. Um, practice talking to people um, in every day. See if you can ask someone some questions. Get information out of them without being suspicious. Um, get some of your friends and family and ask them to agree that over the next three months, I'm trying to learn social engineering. I send you phishing emails. Do I have your permission? Um, and you can go through the whole process, setting up fake portals, finding finding out the applications they're using, test your family and friends. Seems like it's definitely worth it with the profitability in the industry. So definitely consider it if you uh, are interested in social engineering, Cody. Um, so we only have uh, three more questions. Uh, sure. Soraya asked, uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, quote-unquote, once something is on the internet, it's there forever? That's pretty true. Um, I like we talked about with the Wayback Archive, Twitter Archives, all of those things. If you don't want it public, you shouldn't post it online, because once it's online, it is there. Someone has that information. Forever, right? Yeah. And then uh, Andres questioned if you have, if your organization has any internship opportunities. Um, unfortunately, we do not. Um, if it ever comes I, up, just I'm let us know. It will advertise. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. And our last question is, as a follow-up to the legality uh, question, where is the line between using social engineering te techniques on publicly available information, such as in search engines? Uh, and breaching someone's privacy. So I guess asking about what where's the fine line with that? That usually has to do with what's in scope. Um, we work to create a scope and permissions document for each engagement we do. And we clearly define 
X types of um, scenarios are out of scope. Anything impersonating law enforcement maybe is out of scope. Um, anything um, health, that might be out of scope. Uh, and we'll, for each um, target or engagement we do, we, we have a scope document. What types of scenarios are in scope? What types are out of scope? Um, anything about uh, sex, um, anything of that nature is typically out of scope. Um, relationships or anything like that typically is out of scope. Okay. Um, so I think that's all the time we have. But uh, William, thank you again for uh, giving this very interesting uh, talk. I definitely am going to try to secure my social media, and I suggest the same for all of my peers here. So uh, have a wonderful day, and uh, thank you to all of our participants as well for uh, taking the time to listen to William.